For a while now, the Kenya police has grappled with the challenges posed by criminal gangs. These gangs have used all manner of excuses to preposition the public to tolerate their existence. But underneath all the misleading arguments, some of which have been laced with religious undertones, is a harsh reality. Over the years, these criminal gangs have engaged in such serious crimes as murder, robbery, extortion, and blackmail. Their actions have trampled on the legal and moral rights of Wananchi, violated the sanctity of life, and desecrated the individual's right to own property. Their main calculation is to use fear to exploit other Kenyans economically, and they are willing to kill to do this. The feature you are about to watch takes us beyond the headlines of one such group. It has been prepared with the contribution of many ordinary citizens who have volunteered information in keeping with the strategy of community policing. This feature is real and contains some footage of our crime archives. Some of this footage is shocking. A look at 50-year-old Mama Mary Waithera Wanjenga tells the story of her shattered life. On the outside, her well-kept rural compound in Kiogora village, Banana, in Kiambu district, shows a self-reliant, hard-working peasant farmer struggling to keep her farm going with a host of mixed farming activities. But the story of her life is tied to the two graves next to her cowshed. One belongs to her husband, who died of diabetes six years ago, a fact she has stoically taken in her stride as she assumed the role of head of family. <laughs> For six years since her husband's death, she raised her four children as only a mother can, giving room for growth of non-mainstream talent as she encouraged her last-born child, Nicholas Mark Mbogwan Jenga, to become a budding artist. A career he took to a formal level when he joined a Nairobi-based school of fine art. Akaza kuona mimi nikifunga hii kazi ni ada kazi yangu ya kushora. Si nitakuwa mzuri sana. Ukisiona hapa nyumba naweza zaga. But all these hopes and hard work and dreams lie in a second grave next to the young artist's father. One morning as she arrived back home from a friend's funeral, she found her homestead in mourning. Mimi, kija hapa. Watu wanajaa huku kwa guu. Kote hata, kila mahali situwezi kuigia. Nikisifika pale kwa geti, nikashidwa na kuigia. Sababu nimeshidwa ni nini kulifanyika kwa angu. Her last born son, Nicholas, who was home for the holidays, was dead. But there was more. Wakasema tutanyamaza hivyo hata watu wa huku family zetu ati asionyeswe hiyo mtoto yake asimuone vile yako sababu ataharibika kichwa Her son wasn't just dead he had been murdered and not just murdered his body had been mutilated Fully aware of her dangerously fragile state and the affection she had towards her last-born son, the neighbors and relatives would not let Waidera see her son's body. Pictures and memories are all that are left to Waivera and her family. Two years later, her calloused hands still cradle her son's paintings, showing them to anyone who visits her forlorn home, hanging desperately onto the memory of a young man she loved. Still, it is obvious residents of Banana Division know more than she does. But they still don't tell her much. She loved her son too much 
to know the truth and neither confess it. Naweza kusema. Kwasa kama mimi mtu anaweza kuniambia kweli. Hata wawezi kuongea mahali nipo. Hakuna mtu anaweza sema. As why there are struggles to understand the fear and pain her son encountered before his life was snuffed out. Another family in Dumberi of Kiamba Division, Kiambu District, still struggles to come to terms with another death that occurred in the same period. I can be a Gino. I'm a Wawa. I'm a Kishwa. I'm a Kishwa. I'm a Kishwa. Town. Mahali matatu ina bebea watu. Ya kwenda Ruiru na Nairobi. Mze Jino Njuguna of Kiambu still reeks of bitterness and pain as he recalls the murder of his grandson. His relationship with Dominic Njino was personal. The young man, as per Kikuyu tradition, was named after him. And his violent death has left a deep scar that the old man in his sunset years still struggles to come to terms with. Nikuta mwili yake. Amekatwa singo. Kesho hakuna. Ametolewa hospitali. Amekata amekatwa hali ya wanaume wote. Ai kuchi. Hata viatu hana. A morning of terror that shocks both Kiambu residents and provincial administrators alike. Jambo la kupinga la kupisha na kushangaza ni kwamba tulikuta kichwa ambacho hakikuwa na mwili kimewekwa hapo. Kwa kapepa bag kimewekwa hapo juu, juu kapepa bag ya green na kichwa kimewekwa pale. Na baada ya kudurusudurusu na kuchunguza tulikuja kutambua ni kijana tulikuwa tunamjua zaidi. Kijana alikuwa anaitwa Gino. Na shida sasa tuliyopata ni kwamba kichwa tunacho hapo lakini hatuna mwili 60 kilometers away in Muranga district Robert Mwangi Kiunjuri a school teacher in Kianjogu in Kahora division is a witness to another blood curdling occurrence when i woke up at 3 am in the morning for a short call and during that time uh, when i when i shone my torch I found that there was a human head on my cane's pen and on going closer I realized that the human head was belonged to a person whom I knew. Totally different security situation, not mere theft or robbery, a reign of terror. When night comes, in fact we cannot even move out of the out of the door because of the fear walipoingia wali wali tayari walikuwa wamepiga mlango lisasi walipata kama tayari ameanguka tuliadhiwa ati driver alimaliziwa hapo hapo alafu alafu alikatwa kichwa walikatakata watu tatu morning relatives scared residents reported for two years in the news media as news briefs and TV clips. But underneath it all, a horrible reality and a torturous path still yet to be navigated in a tricky effort to understand and contain a group of killers. May 2007, a security threat looms over five districts in the expansive central province of Kenya and some parts of Nairobi. Several incidents of violent murders are reported. The unique aspect of this situation is that nothing is stolen from the victims, but the method employed in the murders is chilling. The victims, mostly male, have their heads cut off 
their private parts dismembered and their body parts recovered in different locations. The media and government security forces links the killings to a well-known but little understood group known as the Mungiki, a quasi-religious organization banned in 2002. For almost three years, Mungiki's activities appeared confined within its secret membership until 2006 when a trail of bodies started being linked to its activities. Unknown to the public, Mungiki had changed its tactics. Mama Waidera, whose student son, a self-made fine artist, was beheaded in June 2006, is still bewildered as to why her son was targeted. <laughs> It is a story confirmed by neighbors and family. Her son Nicholas Mark Mbogwan Jenga, self-driven, enterprising, and firm in his Catholic faith, had opened a stall in Nairobi's Kenyatta market to sell his drawings and complement his mother's earnings that paid for his studies. His dream, however, is cut short. And he is not the only young man who pursued self-reliance who ended up as a Mungiki target. Mungiki was recruiting members. Unlike earlier when membership was voluntary, the new tactic was forced recruitment. <laughs> Dominic Njino, a matatu conductor on the Nairobi Kiambu Road, was also a target. Working in the matatu industry, which was infiltrated by the Mungiki, he was given an ultimatum to join the group. Wiki atatu, walikuja hapa, wako muambia, kama utake kuingia chama chetu, ungoje ripoti yako kesho. Ripoti yako kesho, ni kesho wa ilipatikana, kiambu, imekatwa. Mwiri iku hapa, na kesho iku kiambu. Iye diyo ripoti tulipata. He used to say no. He always made it clear that he will not join them. He used to tell me, Mom, these people want me to join them, and I will not. Whatever happens, I will not join them. If they want to kill me, let them do it, but I will not join them. He told me every time he met them. Wengine wali ujiunga uoga uoga manake labla meshutishwa na labla meogopa. Otherwise, wala wengi wali yokataa. Mungiki sect members burst into the national limelight in the 1990s with unorthodox habits that included tobacco sniffing, trademark dreadlocks, and praying while facing Mount Kenya. In less than a decade, they presented a fearful force that no longer drew curiosity, but fear. Dr. Mutuma Rutere, a political scientist at the University of Nairobi and a human rights activist, recently released a book that attempts to dissect the politics of Mungiki violence in Kenya. It is criminal. There is a, there is a section um, within it that believed that, you know, this actually is a route to go back to a different way of life, you know, we get baptized to a traditional way. Um, there is a group within it that sees this as an opportunity to earn a daily living. But to the grieving Mzen Jino, a religion cannot be used to explain Mungiki's activities. <laughs> A religion can be positive, religion can be negative. When 
a religion begins to undertake negative trends that threaten security and stability of peace-loving communities, it becomes an issue. To the Kenya police, the connection between Mungiki and religion masks a dangerous reality that is a direct threat to law and order. We have not going to look for people in their place of worship. We come for you if you have started interfering with the rights of other Kenyans. More worrying to law enforcement officials is Mungiki's involvement in activities that mirror an organized crime syndicate. We get very interested when you threaten people with their own private property that you either give me this percentage of your income daily or I harm you or I commit murder. Several districts of Central Province have borne the brunt of Mungiki's economic exploitation. Nasikia watu wa matatu za pika wanao bebea watu mizigo walikuwa wameshuchu kwamba watakuwa wakichukua kutoka kwao shilingi 100 kila siku. Watu wa kuuza sukuma wiki na mboga na maembe walikuwa wameshuchu watakuwa wakitishwa shilingi 50 kwa kila siku. Muranga was worst affected. From matatus to petty traders Mungiki included peasant farmers in their list of targets. In Molem village in Makoyo, Esther Wairimo is surrounded by fresh memories, painful memories of one rainy night that drastically altered the course of her life. Alikuwa anapiga risasi, zinapitia kwa wardrobe zinampata bwanangu pande ya nyuma ya mlango. Her husband, Frederick Kamau, was added to a growing list of victims of Mungiki whose form of violence had now extended to shooting their victims. Wanjiru's husband, Kimani, was operating a new matatu. As was customary with Mungiki's mode of operation, a toll fee was demanded. He did not pay. He got killed. Triadiwa, ati driver, ali maliziwa hapo hapo. Alafu, alafu, ali kato kicho na conductor wake wakiwa wote wawili alafu sisi tukadamana mpaka hapo na tulikuta damu nyingi hapo alafu tukaenda Moshare Muranga Still in Muranga district we encounter an elderly couple still mourning the death of their son John a budding young entrepreneur whose savings had been channeled into the border border business tulipata uh, walikatakata wako wa, walikatakata watu tatu John was pronounced dead at 11 a.m. the next day Being old did not provide any safety from Mungiki 70 year old Danson Weruri Mwangi has the scars to prove it Hawaio kadwe nena mabanga There came two thugs wielding machetes. They asked me for money. Kanale besha, de mane besha. Nani mungiki? They were mungiki. Maki goza bage. Yuga shaka shai nisho tukigia na toni uni nyonia unego ukire giku tukigia na kula nyumba nora wada kutonyali. Ura wale ha ajali. Ura wadi yo boku. In the ensuing argument they cut off my left hand from the wrist down. They then fled as this whole place was littered with blood. Nyana kenya ugire ebu. And these are the brave ones, the few willing to talk. In this place, too much talk about this terror gang can earn you a death sentence. From Muranga, which for years has been one of their key operating points, Mungiki is being felt in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Beginning the late 1990s, their members started a systematic and forceful takeover of management of commuter service vehicles, specifically the matatu industry. Those standing in the way were ruthlessly dealt with. Haya, sasa hizi receipt mnaona hapa. Tunalipa kwa Mungiki. The growth of Mungiki's economic empire has extended to Nairobi city slums, notably Madare, Kariobangi, and Kayole in the east of the capital. It is in these slums that their most vivid confrontation with security forces has been witnessed. In Nairobi, 
the ruthlessness takes a different dimension. It now mostly involves the use of guns with deadly consequences. June 2007, Mungiki claims two members of the police force doing a normal patrol round in Kariobangi area of Nairobi. Constable Joel Kitur, who was part of the patrol team, survived the deadly assault. Two policemen from the scene. It's an attack mounted from the dreaded Kalashnikov rifle, commonly known as the AK-47, with devastating effect. Sana. 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 In Karatina, Mze Michael Githai Gangure mourns the death of his slain son, Constable Kaunda, one of the two policemen gunned down in Kariobangi. Bicha, who you mschana, kua, kua, kukua, kifikiria, e habaria bonaake, kifikiria habaria bonawake. One week later, two other policemen are gunned down in Nairobi's Madare area in trademark execution. It's Mungiki. And again, AK-47 rifles are used. The existence of one illegal firearm outside there is a present and imminent threat to the rights and freedoms of every individual in Kenya. At the police training college Kiganjo, the training is now tempered by the reality of a growing danger. At the CID headquarters in Nairobi, Massive gun recoveries from the Mungiki and the Sabaot Land Defense Force has prompted the increased use of forensic science to increase the pace of tracking the illegal militia guns. And Mungiki's guns are now being connected to a good number of matatu jacking and bank robberies in major towns, including the capital, Nairobi. Seeing that Mungiki is not a big problem because after all we are paying only 100 shillings is a very short-sighted, a very simplistic way of interpreting a very serious problem. When a Mungik takes on a tone that is negative, killings, maiming, uh, destroying property, going after certain organized um, economic ventures like um, uh, public transport and so on by force, using arguments, this becomes negative. And so it has to be tackled from that angle. Don't forget that a firearm is considered as a power and a firearm in the wrong hands is considered even more power. To the peasants in the affected areas, the argument goes beyond the oft quoted disenfranchised youth and the question of culture. <laughs> In Banana, Maman Joroge refuses to let go of the pain even as she dutifully manages her daily duties as a mother and tending daily to the grave of her slain son.
na ndio nilikuwa naomba Mungu nikamwambia kinipe zangu baba nitawasomeza mahali taweza nitaweza mimi mm. and she hangs on to a young man's dream that was extinguished by a murder she still does not fully grasp yet the defiance and heroic resilience is also evident they are starting to speak out hesitantly some are outrightly daring against a menace that has functioned by the spread of fear nikiogopa na mimi ni mzee nani atasema kama mimi nani atasema in kiambu chief george kibugi mburu is also hopeful that the fear factor enforced by the mungiki can be broken wajaribu kukupata imani na kukubalia kwamba imani ishabadilika and the ground swell is starting to pick up the pace slowly but surely in dumberry the father of slain matatu conductor dominic njino in spite of his loss reasserts the values he says are central in the manner he raised his late son what i will say regarding those people is that one should eat from their own sweat and hard work because what you have worked for is what you can enjoy without worry without waste and with satisfaction his wife though tearful defiantly answers when asked what pains her the most is it her son's death or the manner in which he was murdered instead she says she is proud of him he did not forsake his faith i believe that people should not fear the mungiki you should overcome the fear when they tell you to join mungiki you need to stand firm in your faith in god and resist because death is inevitable in this life they do not feature in the media anymore and a lot of their tales remain untold it is difficult to tell how many though their tears for their loved ones are far from drying they evidently are staying on the path of hope that it can all end one day that their right to life and property peace and security and justice though temporarily challenged will one day prevail the matatus still ply the roads the small traders still sell their wares the peasant farmers attend to their farms every day the brave ones act like life is normal until you look closer then you can still tell the fear of the unknown of the unpredictable of a dark shadow they know lurks for them any day could be a critical moment of reckoning for them the time to act could not have come sooner as you have seen mungiki is a ruthless gang that has no qualms about committing murder and other serious crimes all of us as kenyans have a duty to expose them have them stopped and have them prosecuted there will always be people who are determined to live a criminal life but our resolve as kenyans that violence and crime as a means of earning an easy life does not have a place in kenya needs to be clearly strongly and firmly spelled out and it will be looking past the horror mungiki has exposed some kenyans to we have also met men and women whose only wish is to live in peace and to continue their daily lives these are decent honest and hard working people and they have a right to peace and security for their sake and the sake of every kenyan who plays by the rules it is imperative that we act in one accord to ensure that crime does not pay and must never be seen to pay we pay credit to the kenyans who have taken time through our community policing efforts to give information and expose those gangs for what they really are criminals with no regard for human life as for the criminals i have one message for them the kenya police is determined to protect the rights freedoms and liberties of law abiding citizens from criminals including mungiki 
this campaign will continue until the last of these groups are prosecuted.
Jenga tells the story of her shattered life. On the outside, her well-kept rural compound in Kiogora village, Banana, in Kiambu district, shows a self-reliant, hard-working peasant farmer struggling to keep her farm going with a host of mixed farming activities. But the story of her life is tied to the two graves next to her cowshed. One belongs to her husband, who died of diabetes six years ago, a fact she has stoically taken in her stride as she assumed the role of head of family. <laughs> For a while now, the Kenya police has grappled with the challenges posed by criminal gangs. These gangs have used all manner of excuses to preposition the public to tolerate their existence. But underneath all the misleading arguments, some of which have been laced with religious undertones, is a harsh reality. Over the years, these criminal gangs have engaged in such serious crimes as murder, robbery, extortion, and blackmail. The actions have trampled on the legal and moral rights of what... But all these hopes and hard work and dreams lie in a second grave next to the young artist's father. One morning, as she arrived back home from a friend's funeral, she found her homestead in mourning. <laughs> Her last born son, Nicholas, who was home for the holidays, was dead. But there was more. For six years since her husband's death, she raised her four children as only a mother can, giving room for growth of non-mainstream talent as she encouraged her last-born child, Nicholas Mark Mbogwan Jenga, to become a budding artist, a career he took to a formal level when he joined a Nairobi-based school of fine art. Renchi violated the sanctity of life and desecrated the individual's right to own property. Their main calculation is to use fear to exploit other Kenyans economically, and they are willing to kill to do this. The feature you are about to watch takes us beyond the headlines of one such group. It has been prepared with the contribution of many ordinary citizens who have volunteered information in keeping with the strategy of community policing. This feature is real and contains some footage of our crime archives. Some of this footage is shocking. A look at 50-year-old Mama Mary Waithera 